I think any heist movie that deals with police corruption and the idea of good and evil and law and criminality being two sides essentially of the same coin is going to be heavily indebted to Michael Mann's Heat. I mean, that's just how it is. When Heat came out in 95, I think it was, it just totally changed how crime movies worked. You know, I think it's one of the all-time great action films. And it's very difficult to make a film about corrupt cops involved in criminality without treading on Heat's toes. I gather that Triple Nine was actually originally set in Los Angeles. Mm. I'm very glad the finished film isn't because, you know, that's Michael Mann's town. You can't make a film there without basically falling into Heat's shadow. And one of the things that I think really works in Triple Nine, which, by the way, I think is very almost very, very good indeed, uh, is the characterization of Atlanta itself. You know, it's a standard critic thing to say the setting is like another character in the movie, but here it really is. You know, you get this sense that the music of the city, uh, the gang culture, and this idea that there's this kind of grubby green grey colour to everything, but that is cut through with these incredible splashes of, of, of neon and excitement. The opening sequence in this film is incredibly good. It's, it's uh, one of the first bank heists they pull off. Um, one of the characters gets a little bit greedy and takes some money from the safe as well as what they've been sent in to retrieve. Mm. And the money has been treated with this bright red anti-theft dye. And so when they're driving along that freeway you were talking about, the the dye suddenly explodes in this enormous crimson cloud in the back of the car and it comes billowing out of the windows. And you have this vehicle streaking across the screen, trailing this very bright colour. And this is a motif that comes up again and again later in the film. You have this kind of hot pink fingerprint dust yeah. and when the police cars gather in a state there are tubs of neon paint hurled out of windows and splatter across the place now these are my favorite parts of the film where actually it doesn't really have much to do with moving along this plot of which policemen are we going to find to attack in order to divert attention it's just this kind of uh the, the police process of what these guys do day in day out on the streets of atlanta you know it, it, it's almost like the wire in that it's about being immersed in this very particular street culture. And some of the characters, Anthony Mackie's character, Clifton Collins Jr.'s character, the, yeah. the, the two corrupt cops, have basically been poisoned by the streets. And they have, they've have they been brought down to that level. And then you have Woody Harrelson, who has made peace with this chaos. And he talks kind of almost affectionately about, uh, you know, out-monstering the monster. And yeah. the monster is kind of constantly mutating. You have to stay one step ahead of the monster. He wears a Stars and Stripes tie, Woody Harrelson, which this is, is Woody, just fantastic. It's Woody Harrelson basically doing Woody Harrelson to the nth degree. I mean, films Brilliant. like Rampart and mm -hmm. also the, the, the TV series True Detective that he did with Matthew McConaughey, this idea that he does these incredibly scummy, corrupt policemen that are always pursuing their own agenda. It's just something that he does very well. So I think the atmosphere is very good. But actually watching the film, it really reminded me of the experience of watching Lawless, John Hillcoat's previous film, and that you have this terrific cast and you have a film that very much looks the part, you know, great kind of costume design, uh, set dressing, you know, shot beautifully. And you have these incredible high points, like that sequence at the start of the, the bank heist and then the, the, the red cloud spraying all over the place. But for some reason, it just cannot maintain this momentum from set piece to set piece. And a lot of the downtime between it, it does feel like it falls into that heist movie cliched stuff. You know, the, the characters, Chiotel, Edgy for fantastic. Kate Winslet as well as this Irina Vlaslov, uh, the head of the kosher mafia. Very much what you describe as a post-BAFTA win performance. You know, this idea that um, post -BAFTA people who that win mean? awards like to kind of cool down. Yeah, but they don't. They don't a, choose those. I mean, they don't funny. choose these films. They, 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 she'll have made this film before. No, sure, but this is how it always comes out. You know, Eddie Redmayne in Jupiter Ascending last year. You know, after he's been praised uh, to to the heavens for playing Stephen Hawking in the Theory of Everything, he then plays this kind of flamboyantly camp supervillain from outer space. It, I mean, you know, a, fair that, enough. That's just that's, that's just, just actor choices. You play something you want. You know, for your own head, you want to be changed. But it's, it's nice to see after. You know, she's been Kate Winslet has been kind of pounding very sincerely the award circuit, and then to come out with this slightly kind of camp heightened performance in this. So that stuff's all very good. It's just the idea that the film cannot sustain this energy between these great set pieces. There's another lovely bit with um, Anthony Mackie and uh, um, Casey Affleck, who the plays bar. the straight arrowed cop. Hmm. Um, they go to investigate this drug dealer who's um, in in this tower block, and they're clearing out the the tower block room by room. And so there's obviously this element of mistrust: Are we going to get jumped? But also there's this mistrust between the two police cops because they don't know whether they can trust each other. So there's this kind of mistrust upon mistrust upon mistrust, which works really the well. The tension in that scene is brilliant. I mean, he does things, uh, John Hillcoat's like, there's this, in that scene, it's just Casey Affleck with a bullet shield in front of him and a gun and a couple of guys behind him. And they go into one room and there's just this baby lying on the bed. 
Well, and that's that was, it. It's just, and, it's and the you suddenly just the tension twist. just rises in a, in a way, and and you know there's some decapitation stuff, and I mean, but I felt that he did uh, in between the heisty bits and the challenge, uh, the um, action bits. I felt that he did retain the the tension and the colour of their life. I, I mean, Casey Affleck's home life, I thought, was very well drawn, and. Uh, Woody Harrelson plays his, his uncle and stuff. So the, those threads, I thought, were very well pulled, really. I think that's that's interesting because it was actually the home life stuff and the, the chemistry between um, Casey Affleck's character and his girlfriend. To me, it just didn't kind of move things forward. I mean, the, the problem is, again, I, you know, I know this film isn't Heat, but when you have a film like Heat where it just has this kind of total mineral clarity to all the characters' motives, where they're coming from, what they represent on this mythic tableau that, you know, that is Michael Mann's Los Angeles, here it just feels less ambitious and less invested in, in, in making these characters incredibly memorable. So you have incredible set piece high points and then these lulls in between.